this thank you for alerting me so uh, so this is where we were last time we were we talked about in order to get uh, a galaxy spectrum at any given time point in time uh, you need to know what is the imf uh, you need to know how stars evolve on the hr diagram as a function of time uh, as a function of mass and metallicity as well uh, and then if you know all of these things you need a spectral library uh, which is a function of uh, metallicity mass and uh, age uh, that will give you a spectrum given these three numbers should give you a spectrum and all of the above are very uncertain at high masses and low metallicities uh, primarily because very hard to find examples of, of such stars in the in in our galaxy and uh, therefore it's very hard to calibrate models correctly uh, star formation history uh, when did stars form and at what rate okay so you need it over the entire lifetime uh, of the galaxy and you need to know how much uh, dust there is at this moment of time and uh, how, how much uh, attenuation it produces so with dust it's a little bit tricky because there are two numbers you need to know one or three numbers rather what is the uh, what is the total optical depth of the dust? Okay, that is one. And how is the dust distributed? Is it all in one place or uh, it's distributed in different places? So the same amount of dust can produce different optical waves, uh, depending on how it is clustered. And the third thing you need to know is the dust temperature because uh, the dust, uh, like stars, is the main emission is thermal. So uh, uh, you need to know at what temperature it is for you to approximate it with a black body or a gray body and so on, and uh, determine the dust emission. So, so dust is a little bit complicated, but it can still be modeled. But if you know all of these parameters, uh, you were able to get the galaxy spectrum by simply adding up uh, the starlight from all the stars. Yes, correct. So you're right. So it's not as severe a problem as it is. sounds it will you will make an error for predicting the spectrum of a galaxy at high redshifts right but if you're looking at a local low redshift galaxy whatever has happened to that galaxy at high redshift does not impact that much uh, the uh, properties of the galaxy locally so even if you get the star formation history in its past uh, totally wrong let's say in the first giga year of its lifetime, you may make a small 5% or 10% error in, let's say, the current properties, the star formation rate or stellar mass and so on. So it's not that critical in the parameters that we can actually measure. Sorry? Huh. I'll, I'll come to that. So this, uh, this talk is mostly about that. But before we go there, I would just like to discuss possibilities for uh, seminar dates. Uh, so I spoke, uh, I had an email exchange with Asim, and he told me that he's planning to have his exam on the 2nd of May, which is the official last date of your course. So if that is correct, then during the week of 25th to 29th, I would like to have the seminars. My last lecture will be on the Monday of that week, which is 25th. Uh, so then if we can do it over two sessions, uh, either Tuesday, Wednesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, uh, then we can finish it off, right? Now, uh, Asim uh, has agreed to uh, shift one of his two lectures out. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the Asim's lecture. So we will have the mornings free on uh, on any of those two, two of those three days. Uh, 
with this schedule. So shall we do Tuesday, Wednesday or Wednesday, Thursday? Anything is fine with me. Twenty sixth, twenty six, twenty seventh, or twenty seven, twenty eighth? Huh? Is better? Okay. Okay, that will give you more time to study for your exam later on. So, shall we just say Tuesday, Wednesday? Are there any comments on the Zoom uh, uh, call? People here are suggesting let's do it off on Tuesday and Wednesday morning. And we have uh, 20 people. So we, uh, even if you take everybody sticks to time, 20 minutes, which means three people per hour. So to do uh, 10 people, you need three hours, uh, 20 minutes of time. We will take a 10, 15 minute break for tea or something like that. I can organize tea over here so you don't have to go anywhere. Uh, and uh, those, of course, who are joining remotely will have to make their own arrangements. We'll take a short break so that in three and a half hours, we can finish. So if we start at 9.30, by one o'clock, we are done. Uh, I would prefer offline. Uh, that, that gives uh, a much better feel for what you have understood or not. But it's not compulsory. I, I understand some people are still not here, right? That is the case so of course if you are not here you don't have to be here but for those of you who are in town uh, i would prefer the seminars to be done uh, uh, offline uh, the way they will be grouped together is that we will uh, uh, have the more broader uh, papers on the first day and we will have the more specialized papers on the second day and we will group together uh, papers. So for example, three or four of you have chosen AGN based topics. So all the AGN talks will be together and so on. So I will, I will organize it. Uh, you are going to be graded on this by three people. Uh, one is me, uh, one is Yash, and the third person is Pritish Mishra, who used to be a PhD student here, now is a postdoc at Ayuka. Uh, he will he will also be helping with the grading. So, yeah. So, any any questions on uh, anyone from the Zoom call? Yeah. So, if not, let us go back. So, so I'll send out an email today. Uh, we will have it on Tuesday and Wednesday, 26th and 27th of April uh, in the morning from 9.30 to 1. Yeah. Uh, right. So, so today we are going to spend most of our time talking about what is called stellar population synthesis. Okay. And this is a technique for actually doing exactly what we were talking about, how to construct a galaxy spectrum uh, uh, if we know the distribution uh, of its stars and uh, the dust in it. Uh, so central to that is the concept of a simple stellar population, SSP for short. So the simple stellar population describes the evolution in time of the SED. SED stands for spectral energy distribution of a single coeval stellar population at a single metallicity and abundance pattern. Okay, so uh, uh, so let's look, disintegrate. So first of all, it's a single population, right? Then it's coeval. Coeval means something which is evolving, which has formed at the same time. So imagine one instance of formation. Today we formed uh, 50 stars in an, in, in, in an open cluster. Okay. Uh, they are going to have the same metallicity because they were formed in the same physical uh, location. So the, the gas phase metallicity there is, is roughly constant. So they have the same metallicity. They were formed all at the same time. 
with with some IMF, and therefore they are referred to as a coeval stellar population. Uh, they one also assumes that they have the uh, similar abundance pattern. Okay, uh, abundance uh, pattern refers to the uh, usually to the abundance of the alpha elements. Okay, why are alpha elements called alpha elements? Or which elements are alpha elements? Huh? Percentage of of alpha elements is alpha element abundance. Yes, but uh, what are alpha elements? No, alpha elements are anything that whose molecular mass. Is a multiple of the molecular mass of a helium nucleus. Okay, so it is anything with the atomic mass four, eight, twelve, sixteen, etc., are alpha elements because uh, typically when they fuse, etc., there is a involvement of a four helium two uh, uh, nucleus. Okay, so. Uh, that uh, that's why they are called alpha elements and that is why the it's called uh, alpha process okay because remember in radioactivity uh, the ra helium nucleus is your alpha particle huh? not power it's a has to be a multiple of four atomic mass with a multiple of four yes so carbon there are one or two elements that are not truly alpha elements because they don't partic participate in the alpha process uh, reactions necessarily. So they have a bit of uh, ambiguous status. One or two elements are left, uh, but uh, yeah. So, so that uh, defines the abundance pattern. So it's basically metallicity, but a more sophisticated way of uh, defining metallicity. Otherwise, metallicity for astronomers means in abundance of everything except hydrogen and helium. Everything else is a metal, right? So alpha abundance pattern will give you a more, more subtle, more, more nuanced uh, measure of the same parameter. The SSP uh, requires three basic inputs. So if you want to construct an SSP, you need a, a st the stellar evolution theory in the form of isochrones. So isochrones are basically maps of uh, the or the tracks of uh, of a star of a particular mass on the uh, HR diagram. Okay, so you need to know will it evolve with time on the HR diagram? Then you have. Uh, uh, stellar spectral libraries. Okay, so these we looked at last time. These could be synthetic, predict, as predicted by stellar structure and theory, or it can be just observed uh, spectral libraries. Right? And you need to know the IMF. If you know these three things, you can construct the SSP. Now the SSP is going to be a function of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, of time, right? So the SED is of the S corresponding to the simple stellar population. The spectral energy distribution is going to be a function of time. Yeah. So in this, we have not brought in the star formation history yet. Okay, because we are assuming everything formed is like a delta function. Uh, the star formation rate just uh, had a jump and it went down to zero after that. Right? Uh, very simple. So, so this is the whole idea of stellar population synthesis. So you take your IMF, okay, it may be Salpeter, it may be something else. Uh, you take your isochrones. So these are uh, tracks of uh, stars of different masses on the HR diagram. And you take the stellar spectra, right? And the stellar spectra ideally should be a function of age, 
metallicity and mass of the star. These are the three important parameters that will determine for you what is the spectrum. So as a, on a grid of age, metallicity and mass, you should, and for every point on that three dimensional grid, you should have a, a spectrum uh, which can be synthetic or it can be observed. So given these three things, one can construct a simple stellar population, which is shown in the central panel. And what is shown here is the stellar population at different ages, okay? So if you have a very young uh, stellar population, it will have a very high amount of uh, UV flux. And that is because it will have a lot of O and B type stars present in the population. As the, uh, as the simple stellar population ages, it will lose the high mass stars. And so its UV flux will go down and uh, the optical flux and IR flux uh, will still remain high. So this is your uh, simple stellar population evolving in time. Okay. Now to that, we need to add two more ingredients. One is star formation and the other is chemical evolution. Okay. So now what is happening is that you have an SSP has formed all its stars all at once. So the stellar metallicity changes, but only very, very slowly, okay? Or usually not at all. For low mass stars, it hardly changes at all because only hydrogen is getting converted to helium. The higher processes which produce metals, the CNO process and things like that, they don't operate in very low mass stars. And therefore, uh, you don't have to worry about the chemical evolution of the stars. But you do have to worry about the chemical evolution of the uh, of the gas phase. So, for example, if you have I formed at t equal to zero, I formed a set of stars. Some of them went supernova because they were high mass stars. So, those are the stars that are going to pollute the interstellar medium uh, with uh, the gaseous interstellar medium with metals. So, then suppose a billion years later, I formed stars again. Then when I form those stars, then I have to choose a different initial metallicity for those stars because those stars are going to form from the polluted uh, interstellar medium, not from the pristine interstellar medium. And so, so you have to worry about the uh, time-dependent uh, metallicity evolution of the stars. And then the other ingredient, of course, is the star formation rate, right? You, you, your star formation rate could vary as a function of time. You could assume some kind of functional form to simplify your integrations, etc. But you'll have to make some assumptions about the uh, star formation rate. If you know that, and then if you know the dust, okay, now dust will actually be a function of the chemical evolution and the star formation rate also, correct? Because initially there's no dust. There is only hydrogen, there is some helium and minuscule amounts of some other elements. So there's no dust, no silicates and carbonates which are from the bulk of the dust have yet formed in the universe. But as time goes on, the dust will get generated. So if you know what is the star formation uh, rate and the chemical evolution over time, then you can uh, predict the amount of dust there is. Once you know the uh, amount of dust, then you can make some prediction about uh, how much attenuation it will produce as a function of wavelength. So it's going to change your stellar populations and uh, 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 attenuate, generally dust will cause more absorption and scattering at the shorter wavelengths. So it will attenuate the UV light and the blue light and so on and it will attenuate the red light much less, correct? So by adding these three things, you get the simple stellar population. To that, adding in these two components allows you to compute what is called as the composite stellar population. So, so this, this is one example of a dust-free uh, composite stellar population. So this is what you need eventually. This is your spectrum of the galaxy, the composite stellar population. Uh, 
but of course this is unrealistic having no dust uh on the axis uh, x axis is lambda wavelength of the spectrum and this is the log of the intensity so the the strength of the spectrum right. so on the other hand this is of course very unrealistic if you form a lot of stars you will also form dust and then uh, so if you include the dust then this is what a dust spectrum uh, dusty uh, galaxy spectrum looks like and what do you think this corresponds to this peak that you see uh, at far infrared wavelengths no it's uh, it's not in the radio uh, it's not low mass stars low mass stars uh, uh, peak at about uh, uh, 1 micron so this peak is coming from your low mass stars and this is coming in the mid infrared from polyaromatic hydrocarbons but we won't go in that direction what is this peak coming from yes it's coming from thermal emission from the dust okay uh, the surface temperature of low mass stars are still a few thousand uh, degrees kelvin okay but the temperature of the dust can be much will be much lower than that okay you can have cold dust warm dust hot dust all that is there but it is typically few tens of kelvins to few hundreds of kelvins in that range <laughs> and so in the far infrared is where you get a peak of the thermal emission uh how do you determine which one to choose uh, there are indeed multiple models of the imf but uh, nowadays people tend to use only maybe one or two and the chabrier imf uh, is very popular these days because unlike solpeter where it basically keeps on going up so the number of low mass stars becomes very unrealistically high the chabrier imf uh, uh, which is based on real observations uh, made by the lyon group uh, those uh, that is much more realistic now there are small differences between that and other imfs which are in use uh, if you want you can run your simulation run your stellar population synthesis models with different uh, uh, different imfs and check whether that changes the results usually it doesn't change it too much so it's not very the, the biggest parameter that uh, determines your final spectrum is this one the star formation how does star formation happen as a function of time right not even metallicity evolution metallicity changes the spectrum a little bit but not by a huge amount also it depends a lot whether you are trying to model just the shape of the continuum or you are trying to model individual emission and absorption lines in the galaxy if you are doing individual lines then it's much harder and you need to really worry about variations caused by small variations here but if you are fitting the broadband fluxes uh, as measured and you are therefore interested only in the overall continuum shape of the spectral energy distribution then it doesn't matter too much so if you choose chabrier or still miller or still imf or something like that uh, it doesn't matter but it does matter what uh, sf uh, you choose ha huh. so I'll, i'll come to that yeah uh so now really the the main problem is that we are really interested in when we do stellar population synthesis is if given a measured galaxy spectrum can i predict its star formation history how did stars build up in that galaxy how many stars formed 5 giga years ago how many formed 7 giga years ago how many formed only 1 giga year ago and so on so you need that uh but you must remember that the uh, imf spectral library stellar evolution etc all have uh, small errors in them. nothing is perfect uh and there are some uncertainties it says the biggest uncertainties doesn't mean they're big 
they're now quite small. But amongst the uncertainties, the biggest source of uncertainties are incomplete isochrome tables. Okay, so for example, we don't know exactly how uh, high mass stars evolve off the once they leave the main sequence uh, because it, there's a lot of complicated physics uh, in the physics of high mass stars which we don't fully understand. But then there are these incomplete uh, empirical stellar libraries which we also already looked at and poorly calibrated physics, which means you have a physical model, but that has to be calibrated against an observation. And sometimes uh, observation is not possible because that class of object doesn't exist. So uncertainties are generally of two kinds. One are systematic and the other are stochastic. Okay, Systematic means that we just don't have enough information. So we could be way off. Stochastic means your measurement uncertainties are there and that gives you those random errors on the, on your measurements will give you corresponding random errors on your derived properties. Okay. So, uh, so, so how do we construct the uh, spectrum of a galaxy? The spectrum of a galaxy will be a function in general of time but also of the mean metallicity. The metallicity is the thing that is constantly increasing in the galaxy. So you can do that if you know what the IMF is and you know the spectrum of a simple stellar population as a function of mass, as a function of metallicity and as a function of, of time, okay? And here, this is the sort of black body spectrum at some temperature uh, T, uh, which will uh, give you, uh, which is as a function of mass, metallicity, and time. And of course, this whole thing is a function of, of metallicity, okay? So here, this particular uh, SSP uh, is a function of luminosity, is a function of temperature, and is a function of Z. Why are we using temperature? Because temperature is the parameter that is, uh, changes quite drastically when you go off the main sequence. So the sun, for example, right now is at a uh, surface temperature of 6,000 Kelvin. But when it goes off the main sequence and it becomes a red giant, at that time, its temperature will fall quite drastically. So that is why, so this is like a proxy for the evolution of uh, the uh, thing on the HR diagram. How does it move on the HR diagram? And of course, uh, the surface temperature of a particular star will depend on its mass, it will depend on its metallicity and the time. So how it is evolving on the main sequence. So, so this simple stellar population is integrated over uh, all masses okay, by multiplying by the initial mass function and then integrating uh, out over the mass. And what is the mass range you should choose? What is the uh, mass range, uh, 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 the lower limit on the mass range and some upper limit on the mass range? The upper limit, the lower limit is decided by physics. The upper limit is decided by time because as a coeval population evolves, uh, it's going to uh, it's going to change. Uh, the uh, upper mass is going to keep on decreasing. Uh, you can calculate the mass as a function of time, okay? And that you do by uh, using your initial mass function and taking the the mass of uh, in the evolved stars as uh, for different uh, masses uh, and the mass in the remnants as a function of time. Okay. Uh, the time dependent spectrum is what uh, you are really interested in eventually can be written by uh, this expression where psi is the uh, star formation rate and which is uh, multiplied by by this spectrum and the spectrum itself is modified by this term. Uh, what do you think this term corresponds to?
uh, attenuation from dust. So, depending on the optical depth of the dust, uh, some tau lambda, you will get uh, uh, exponential uh, decrement in the flux uh, of of that as a function of of time, right? So, you will get this as a function of uh, of of t if you know this. So what we are trying to do essentially is uh, we, we are measuring the spectrum. We are trying to model this and this and this in a self-consistent way in order to get the primary quantity of interest, which is this, the star formation rate. Uh, so these are the stellar evolution tracks. Uh, well understood at low stellar masses and near solar metallicities, but uncertainties grow at high masses and low metallicities. So we've looked at this uh, several times. I won't spend more time on that. Isochrone models, uh, different ages, different chemical compositions uh, and cover most relevant evolutionary phases. So there are various models that are available. Uh, for example, the Padova models, uh, the Geneva models, uh, uh, which only do high mass stars, uh, the Basti models, and so on. For low mass stars, the models from Chabrier's group at Lyon in France, uh, they are very good. Now, uh, uh, newer models include uh, something known as the y square model, the Dartmouth model, the Victoria Regina model, and so on. It, all of these things are, are very, very difficult things to do. So, for example, the Padova models or the Geneva models are done by a group of astronomers, maybe 10, 15 people, working together for 20 years, 30 years to produce better and better models. Okay. So that's all they do. They are constantly observing stars. So many of these models are, are uh, theoretical models, but they make predictions. Uh, so they'll say that, okay, according to our model, uh, a, a solar metallicity star with twice the solar mass with an age of uh, two giga year should have this spectrum. Okay. And then uh, they'll make a prediction. And then they will go and make observations uh, of such a star. And then they will test their models against it. They'll keep tweaking. Uh, they'll, so they, they, there is a body of papers with is continuous uh, incremental improvement in the models and the measurements and the models again and so on. So very, very tough work. I mean, we as people who use stellar population synthesis model uh, modeling are very dependent on the work of these groups. But they are doing, uh, I mean, I would, uh, some people would think it as uh, quite boring because you're doing the same thing for 20 years, 30 years, but somebody has to do it uh, in order that downstream people can believe it. So they've really improved. Over the last two or three decades, uh, all of these models, which had very high uncertainties, have really improved a lot. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Sanjay, you were saying Yeah, yeah, no, but you don't predict. Uh, yeah, you're right. But sometimes the metallicity is also predicted within the model. So it is not independent of it. So what you do is you have some kind of model for the, the metallicity evolution. And that model allows you to predict what the metallicity should be. And therefore, what the exact depth of the spectral line or the ratio of various lines should be. So it's, uh, there is a little bit of uh, circular arguments there, but it, uh, they resolve it in some self-consistent way. Uh, some very old uh, isochrones are still being used. Okay? So there is one by uh, Schoenberner and uh, uh, Vassiliadis and Wood and Blocker. Uh, these are from the 1990s. The modeling of the post-AGB phase, AGB stands for the asymptotic giant branch. Okay, that is a uh, 
one of the toughest things to do uh, from a purely physical perspective. So people do it via uh, nowadays via numerical simulations. Some kind of codes, uh, very complex codes are written uh, for doing that with some analytical insights and inputs and assumptions and so on. But getting that right is very tricky. And uh, many models have been demolished by observations. So you make some prediction about the post AGB phase and you don't find it. And then you change your model, you make some other prediction. Again, you test it against the observations, you don't find it. So we are, we are still on shaky ground in that. But for main sequence stars, over a range of masses and over a range of metallicities, uh, range of ages, the, the predictions are very, very solid. Yes. When it goes off the main sequence and it's asymptotic because it's sort of asymptotically approaching uh, one value. That's why it's, a, and they're all giants, very high luminosity, AGB stars, they call it. And uh, they go into the AGB phase and post AGB phase, they, they evolve very rapidly on the, on the, on the HR diagram. They move very, very quickly on the diagram. So that, that phase is the tricky phase until in the AGB phase itself, uh, when the uh, things are very stable. But in the post-AGB phase, when the, uh, the spectrum, the surface temperature, luminosity of the star just changes very, very rapidly, uh, getting that right, that track right is very difficult. And we, are, we cannot completely ignore the post-AGB phase because the AGB phase and the post-AGB phase, the stars are, can be quite luminous for at least part of that phase. So they contribute a lot to the light, to the spectrum. But if you don't model them correctly, you will get things wrong. They, they, they go towards their end. And depending on their mass, they will end up as uh, white dwarf neutron star black holes. Yes. Correct. No, no, AGB stage. So, for example, if you take the sun, what is the post giant stage uh, of the sun? It's a red giant. It's shining like a red giant for a long time. But then it quickly becomes a white dwarf. No, no, no. The transition to the white dwarf stage is the post AGB stage. That phase when it is moving from. Uh, Yes. And of course, in high mass stars, very, very complex things happen. All kind of up to iron core, uh, everything is possible. So that is uh, real, really complicated stuff. So implementing isochrons in an SPS model is also challenging because there is no single set of uh, single set of models that span the full range of metallicity, age, etc. Okay. So you have to take, uh, so you'll have to say, okay, I'll take Lyon models for, uh, for the low mass stars. I'll take Geneva model for the high mass stars, etc. But making them consistent with each other uh, can be problematic. So again, so therefore the SPS modeling itself is also not straightforward. To write a stellar population synthesis code is also complicated business. Okay, so understanding all, keeping in this mind, realizing all this complexity, uh, a code uh, called MISA was developed, modules for experiments in stellar astrophysics. It's a highly modular and sophisticated stellar evolution code that includes the latest stellar ingredients, including opacity tables, equations of state, nuclear reaction networks, and surface boundary conditions. So the hope is that MISA will be employed to produce high quality isochrones over the full range of age and metallicity and for all evolution phases. So this is something that uh, is about 10 years old now. 
uh, but uh, I am not exactly aware about how widely it is used and whether it has had the desired impact. But that's the ultimate goal. You have to have it. Think, sir. For the spectral libraries, uh, there are very widely used libraries by uh, Kuruds, and these are theoretical libraries. So, this man, given, uh, uh, given a stellar evolution model, uh, can predict what the spectrum will look like. But there are also lots of empirical libraries that have been compiled by different people by observing uh, different stars. And uh, this is the URL. I think there is a missing tilde over here. Yeah. So now coming to the model of the dust. The there are a number of models uh, that are available, but the most popular model, uh, which is very widely used in uh, many different stellar population synthesis codes, is this model by Charlot and Fall. And what Charlot and Fall uh, said, uh, or the uh, sort of assumption they made while developing their model, is a very simple one. So they said that, okay. Uh, star formation happens in a very uh, dense uh, dust obscured region uh, where as soon as stars form uh, the hydrogen around it gets ionized so they form in a ionized hydrogen bubble uh, that is the h2 region uh, it is surrounded by uh, often by neutral some amount of neutral hydrogen gas which has still not gotten ionized by the star formation process and beyond that is the broader interstellar medium so the interstellar medium is is similar uh, to the interstellar medium here but the diffuse interstellar medium is at a lower density uh, and a lower pressure compared to the high density high pressure region uh, that you have in the uh, uh, in the H two regions, correct? Now, so if stars form in uh, in this H uh, two region, initially they will be quite obscure because they will be surrounded by a lot of dust. Now, what will happen? Let's say uh, ten raised to seven years later, ten raised to eight years later. I have formed as per some IMF, I've formed a lot of stars in that H2 region. I've formed them today. If I wait 100 million years, what will happen? Or let's say even 10 million years. <coughs> Dust will start to go because of? No. Huh? Yes, there is dust ablation, which means dust, the smaller dust particles get destroyed, the bigger dust particles uh, get eaten away, they decrease in size. So all that will happen once star formation happens. But what else will happen within 10 raised to 7 years or after 10 raised to 7 years? Ah. Metallicity will change, but what can happen to the dust itself? Yes, because let's say one even one star goes supernova over here, what's going to happen? It's going to blow away the dust. Okay, it can completely disrupt the dust cloud. And uh, what will then be? So, if you are looking, this is a photon that is coming from here. In the first 10 raised to 7 here, years, it's going to have a higher opacity because of there is going to be surrounded by a cloud of dust. But uh, after 10 raised to 7 years, it will have a lower opacity corresponding to the opacity of the diffuse interstellar medium. Right? So there will still be absorption of light by the diffuse interstellar medium. But the birth cloud in which these stars form, that would get destroyed. Right, and therefore the the optical depth will decrease. 
So under this very, very simple assumption, they developed a model. And it turns out from whatever experimental uh, verifications we have carried out of that model, uh, that uh, this model is, uh, is quite, quite, quite robust. Okay. So, uh, so there is, so what they say is that, okay, uh, there will be some optical depth uh, in the V band. Okay. You can fit it as a, as a free parameter that will have some dependence on wavelength. There'll be some power loss slope of that. Uh, that is well understood. I mean, that is what you would expect from uh, Rayleigh scattering and things like that. Uh, when this is when the age of the cloud is less than 10 raised to seven years. When the age of the cloud becomes greater than 10 raised to seven years, you have an additional uh, factor mu uh, in front, which reduces the, uh, the overall opacity, okay? Or the optical depth. So what is this? This TV is the effective V-band optical depth seen by young stars. Uh, the characteristic H 10 raised to 7 corresponds to the typical lifetime of a giant molecular cloud. Giant molecular cloud gets destroyed, disrupted 10 raised to 7 years after uh, stars form within it. Mu defines the fraction of the total dust absorption optical depth of the galaxy, which is contributed by the diffuse interstellar medium. So if you want to choose a number for that, mu of one third is, is typical uh, with substantial scatter. So there's a lot of scatter there from the experimental measurements we made. Uh, but if you want a typical number, that is it. So this constitutes for you the, the dust extinction model. So suppose I have a simple stellar population that I formed today. While computing its spectrum for the next 10 raised to 7 years, I use this formula. After 10 raised to 7 years, I use this formula. Very simple. Okay. So the central question, if we have a galaxy spectrum, can we determine its star formation history? Yes, in principle, within all the uncertainties that we have looked at, the problem can be that the star formation history may be degenerate, which means multiple histories may fit the same observations uh, uh, within the error bars. Now, we don't, to simplify integration and things like that, we assume some simple analytic form for the star formation rate. And popular uh, uh, options seem to be a single burst, okay, so like a delta function, uh, or an exponentially decaying SFR, which means you suddenly form a lot of stars, and then the star formation rate uh, decays exponentially with time. Or you can have a constant SFR which means you start forming stars at some point, have it constant, and then maybe it exponentially decays or it stops suddenly. Okay, so now let us look at the, at the degeneracies. So here is a state where uh, you have uh, two objects which have uh, different ages, but the same metallicity, okay? So one is a one giga year old composite stellar population or simple stellar population. And this is a 13 uh, giga year old population. Okay. So as we expected, the, the uh, UV side flux uh, will, will go down uh, for the older stellar population, uh, which is exactly uh, what we see in this figure. So no problem. There will be no problem distinguishing. Uh, we will never get confused that this particular spectrum corresponds to a young stellar age or old stellar age, right? We, we will definitely be able to say it's old and this one is young. However, uh, there are situations where uh, the age metallicity degeneracy exists, right? 
and this age metallicity de de degeneracy is for two populations okay now here it's uh, 13 giga years but with a very low metallicity old population low metallicity and the second curve is for a young population high metallicity and as you can see if you just observe the the continuum spectrum over here uh, you observe it in band here one band here one band here you never be able to tell them apart okay so in order to tell them apart you have two options so how will you tell them apart here come to lower band one option is that you uh, observe at this uh, band you will see that one of them has a low uv flux the other has a high uv flux what is the other option ha huh. yes so there are a lot of absorption lines uh, in the in the spectrum okay in the old spectrum which are sort of missing from the uh, from the young spectrum correct uh, so if you take a spectrum over this region then you will be able to distinguish between so there, there are ways to break the age metallicity de degeneracy but if you say no no i cannot take a spectrum and i cannot observe outside the optical band then that age metallicity degeneracy will hit you very badly right it will totally mess with your results you get totally wrong results older stars older stars produce more and more uh, absorption lines huh yeah, the which one Why is there, uh, what the older stars and metallicity also which will produce more uh, absorption lines if you don't have metals will you get any metal absorption lines so these are all of these are metal absorption lines. Sorry? Oh, go, go, go. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. Hmm. So I don't know. I'll have to look at this. Okay. But the age age argument holds, but not the metallicity argument. Hmm? No, 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 no. It's minus 2.3. It has lower metallicity. So that's the problem. So with such low metallicity, I mean, it's not zero metallicity, it's low metallicity. It does uh, over time produce more absorption. Maybe there there is there are some evolved stars in there that is a possibility that there are evolved stars which have produced some metals uh, and uh, they there are metals in the outer uh, shells of those stars which are producing them. Hmm? correct Correct, correct. Possible. That also might be possible. That there are uh, there are uh, second generation stars in the uh, in the uh, older population. I think that is. High Uh, absorption in the intergalactic medium possible ages yes no these are yeah uh, no no this i'm not even sure whether this is a uh, this is a real observed spectrum i think not these are uh, coming from the stellar population synthesis models okay so i think what is happening is that the the, what you're saying is right that there are some second generation stars uh, which have uh, formed from that old stellar population and those are high metallicity stars so a few high metallicity stars are producing absorption in the old population okay 
Okay. Uh, so what have we learned from SPS? The simple model of star formation history reproduces the colors of today's galaxies fairly well. Uh, we know from these models that the, most of the stars in elliptical and S0 galaxies are old. Uh, the earlier the Hubble type, the older the stellar population. So it's something which I've been just saying out aloud uh, for all these lectures is something that can be shown uh, quantitatively by using SPS models. Uh, and the detailed models of this kind provide information about the star formation history and predictions by the models can be compared with observations of uh, galaxies at high redshift. Okay? And with this, we can look for progenitors of existing galaxies. So suppose I take a local elliptical galaxy and I use stellar population synthesis. And that tells me that, okay, this particular galaxy formed most of its stars 10 giga years ago, right? What I can do is I can look at the Redshift 3 uh, galaxy, which is 10 giga years in the past. And I can say that, okay, now, which is this galaxy, which is forming stars very vigorously. That is the galaxy that is the probable progenitor of this big elliptical galaxy that I see today. So you can make the connection between galaxies you see today and their uh, past. Uh, so these are now predictions of uh, galaxies ordered by, by Hubble type. Okay, So elliptical galaxies are at the bottom and uh, irregular galaxies are at the top. Okay, uh, There are uh, differences in the continuum. Uh, the elliptical galaxies have a red continuum, the spiral and irregulars have a blue continuum. By blue continuum, it, one means that the slope is downwards and here broadly the slope is going upwards. Uh, these will show emission lines. So if you have a lot of uh, high mass stars, uh, then you can see strong emission lines and uh, they will be totally missing. Emission lines will be totally missing in the spectrum of the elliptical galaxy. So there is a continuum of change that you see with morphology and star formation. The normalization on the y-axis is just arbitrary. It is just spectra are shifted by some amounts so that you see them clearly. Uh, this focus on the slope of the spectrum and the emission and absorption lines that you see. Okay. So when you want to do stellar population synthesis, uh, this is how you would practically do it. And uh, this is something that is uh, from a paper by uh, Omkar. Uh, so what he did was he took, so every blue point over here corresponds to a flux measurement. Okay. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is in the uh, first two points are in the UV band. And then there are uh, points in the optical band. And then there are points uh, in the near infrared, in the mid infrared. Uh, these are complex organic molecules known as polyaromatic hydrocarbons. So they have various transitions uh, which uh, can be observed uh, usually between about 5 to 10 microns uh, rest frame emission. And uh, so those are those emission lines come from those uh, complex hydrocarbons. They're called polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And then, of course, this is the, the dust peak. Uh, these data points are from the far infrared, uh, this one too, and then the flux falls. What is this? Why is the flux going up again? Oh, sorry, it's at uh, uh, 10 raised to 6 microns this point. 10 raised to 6 microns is how much? One, One meter. Yes. So this is non-thermal synchrotron emission from, from an active galaxy. Okay. So this, the radio emission is non-thermal. 
everything else is mostly in thermal and in fact the fact that you can quickly realize that the emission is non thermal is the slope okay here you expect the slope to continue being the same you don't expect this to change direction and that change of direction is happening purely because you are looking at a completely different phenomenon nothing related to star formation huh? very few but there are we have some other examples where we have three or four measurements in the radio then matter it is always like this so it's uh, it increases with wavelength or decreases with frequency okay so the these are from the galax uh, survey uh, then the optical points are from the sdss uh, the near infrared points are from qmas and then these points are from wise and this uh, points are from herschel in different bands so we measured the total flux of the same galaxy in many different bands and then we've carried out a stellar population synthesis model okay and in order to assist you with with doing this there are a number of codes that are publicly available and uh, i list some of them here and these codes perform a chi square fit of sps models uh, to the data the data may be broadband fluxes or the data could be uh, spectra themselves huh? uh, outputs are often a posterior uh, pdf probability distribution function obtained by marginalizing over all free parameters except one so what are the kind of free parameters you will have you will have for example the star formation rate as a function of time maybe you will have the dust optical depth uh, as a free parameter right uh, and so on so you'll have a few free parameters uh, there could be free parameters for the imf so maybe you have an imf which is you say is a power law but the slope you don't uh, restrict you, know, you can have different slopes now given that the parameter space is uh, the spectrum is such a non linear function of the different free parameters therefore it becomes uh, a little bit tricky to uh, to avoid degeneracy there is the age metallicity degeneracy but there could be other uh, degeneracy as well and uh, so what is very useful is this kind of bayesian approach wherein what you do is that you produce you you have these input parameters with errors and those input parameters so suppose you have seven input parameters you will get a seven dimensional uh, surface in the chi square right so the chi square surface will be a seven dimensional surface you have to find the minimum but if the minimum is not very steep in some direction then it will have a large error bar right so what you have to do is you have to integrate over all parameters except one marginalize over them so that you get a error bar on all of them now instead of just computing an error bar you can compute a probability distribution function so suppose i have a measure of let's say the star formation rate today i can have a distribution of the star formation rate as the output instead of giving a single value so then you can once you have a distribution you can calculate mean median standard deviation whatever percentile range anything you want because you have the full uh, distribution available so the outputs are typically given as a probability distribution function i have given you a very quick introduction to uh, stellar population synthesis uh, but uh, there is much more to it uh, there are literally hundreds of papers that have been written uh, since the pioneering work of uh, uh, beatrice tinsley uh, 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 astronomer in the us uh, was she was a pioneer in this field uh, in the late 1970s and 80s uh, she wrote 
uh, some of the seminal papers on stellar population synthesis. She unfortunately died uh, at a very young age and therefore uh, that, that ended her career. But there is a recent review by uh, Conroy et al. in 2013. Uh, this is in the annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics, uh, which gives a complete up-to-date summary of the many aspects of SBS that I have not covered. So I'll stop here and take uh, any questions. Yes. Yes. How do you this is the same galaxy? It's they in are, the they are using the same naming criteria or no, you match it in position. So you match it in position. So if it's in the same direction in the sky, with RA depth, yes. Z uh, usually is not available in many uh, in different bands, right? It's available in the optical, but is not available in the other bands. But these are not very high redshift galaxies. These are very big galaxies. Uh, very low redshift. Look at this. Uh, 0 0.0688 is the redshift of this particular galaxy. So, uh, so you don't have to worry about matching uh, the galaxies together because they will be resolved very well resolved in the in the optical and also quite resolved in the infrared also where the resolution is poor. So there is you can match by positional uh, criteria. Are you Give me a name, name. Ha, some error you can give, but the unlike in the uh, optical where the source density of the objects is very high, in the far infrared there are very few objects, relatively. So you find the corresponding source and then you measure that flux. Slide 13. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Why? I mean, in more. No, no, no. no. Correct. No, this has, has to be a star forming region. The star forming region, as per the IMF, will will produce, uh, suppose you have a sufficiently large star forming region, the probability of getting a, a 1 over A type star over B type star is quite high. And this is all done average because remember, we are just doing a model. We are not uh, counting exactly how many uh, supernovae went off or how, how many star forming clouds there are. So the free parameter is going to be the star formation rate. Uh, do you know what uh, unit star formation rate is quoted in? What are the units of star formation? Uh, per unit volume, per unit time, yes. Uh, but what? Number of stars. No, it's actually not number of months. It's in terms of solar masses per year. So the unit is solar masses per year. Over longer periods, there could be mechanisms, but they don't last for longer periods. So this is a very short period of time. 10 million years is a very short period of time. So the moment it forms. And then they can reform. I mean, it's not as if they're destroyed, so it's gone forever. The clouds can again uh, reform under gravity because once those one or two bright stars go supernova, the other stars will not go supernova for a very long time, the low mass stars. So they are cause no damage, uh, but they cause very little damage to the giant molecular cloud. So 
So the giant molecular cloud can form once again. And what also happens is that, uh, remember if they, all of this is happening in the modern context or in the low redshift context is happening in spiral arms, right? Uh, in the high redshift context, it's very different, but in the low redshifts, it's happening in spiral arms. So these stars can also move out. So the O and B stars, they explode, they destroy the giant molecular cloud. The rest of the stars go out of the spiral arm. And uh, new stars, new molecular cloud forms in the overdense region and new stars. Decaying or a constant or a combination of those. It, uh, the supernova can cause uh, two negative feedback to star formation as well as uh, positive feedback. Negative feedback in the sense that in the region surrounding it, whatever gas, don't care, gas, dust, star, anything that's there is just blown off. It's gone. It empties out the space around it. So in that sense, it provides negative feedback. But at a larger distance, it can provide positive feedback because it uh, generates shock compression of the gas. And that shock compression will raise the gas densities to high enough level that uh, it will increase the probability of star formation. So the supernova, very close to the supernova, you decrease the uh, star formation, uh, the probability of star formation. And very little bit farther away from the supernova, you actually increase the in the star formation probability. So it's both. So now exactly which, which happens, that is why it's all parametric. Uh, radiate away, the cooling uh, times uh, become shorter, all that happens, yes. So definitely it helps to have a high metallicity cloud. Uh, now, uh, so, so these things, that's why when we do the star formation rate, we are not using any physical parameters to parameterize. We are using arbitrary mathematical functions, which are sort of physically motivated. I mean, we know that sometimes you have a star burst, which means there is a very brief period of uh, rapid star formation and nothing else happens after that. So, okay, delta function. Uh, then exponential decays is also a little bit physically motivated. But a constant star formation is only possible where uh, things are in very long-term equilibrium. So, for example, in the disk of spirals, uh, like the Milky Way, we'll have constant star formation for a very long time. It's not very high, but it's constant. One or two solar masses per year are getting produced for the last billion years and may continue like this for the next billion years. Yes, so they can also overlap. So it is not as if... Uh, uh, if delta function has happened, uh, the decay can't uh, start or anything. They could be different events. And they could, because they could happen in a different part of the galaxy. So maybe overall there is a sort of exponentially decaying or constant function which is there. But something happens now that creates a delta function once. And a giga year later creates another delta function. So when we have this kind of parameterized form for the star formation history, you can have all, all combinations of this. And each combination will, uh, will create for you a different spectrum. You may not be able have the resolution to distinguish between them, especially these delta functions, right? They contribute a lot, uh, could contribute a lot to the total stellar mass because what happened was there was a delta function you formed like a million stars within a few hundred years 
Okay, let's say I mean, this is very extreme, but uh, let's say you form it. So it added to your stellar mass. But after that, it's not going to manifest in the present star formation rate and things like that. So, so there are there are uh, there are issues, but the whole thing is is very complicated. So what they basically do is that they construct. They say that okay, for every uh, star formation history possible, for every age, for every metallicity, I will create a model. I'll create a galaxy spectrum. And I will do a brute force comparison between my observed spectrum and what is predicted by it. Now, it may well be that uh, out of the million spectra that I have, 100 of them are close matches. And you may not be, if they are various coupled degeneracies, you won't be able to tell which one is the correct one. But most of the time, you'll find that the 100 matches that you have, are from the same region of the parameter space, which means they have almost same age and almost same metallicity, etc. Almost identical star formation history. Then what do you do? You choose one of them, but you give a large error bar because you know it, it could be this, but this nearby uh, model is nearly as good as this one. So you 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 when you construct your posterior uh, uh, probability distribution function, that will come out in that. That okay, there is some error in metallicity, there's some error in the age, there's some error in the star formation history, and so on. So, most of your free parameters will come from the star formation history. 